There is an old adage that suggests storytellers should chase their main character up a tree, throw stones at them, then get them back down. I put that writing strategy in quotes, but I'm not actually quoting anyone. I've heard a similar phrase used by many different people myself. Often the saying is attributed to Vladimir Nobokov. It has since been attributed to many great storytellers. Some quick research suggests that the quote may actually predate Nobokov because it appears in print before he was even born. I fell down a rabbit hole trying to figure out who may have said it first, but I feared that the whole intro to this video would turn into a quote investigation, so you're free to search yourself and come to your own conclusions. It's not the specific quote that I'm here to talk about, but rather the idea. Regardless of who said it, for storytellers, it's just plain good advice. Ultimately, the saying implies that protagonists should face adversity. They should face challenge. Through adversity, perhaps they'll learn a lesson, maybe even one that helps them achieve victory. After a character has faced hardship, they have earned the right to get back down from that tree. Before 2017, the Resident Evil landscape was looking a little grim. Various evolutions of what makes a great Resident Evil game had the fanbase split, some yearning for the old days and others arguing that the series had been pushed rightfully in a new direction. The fourth title was a wildly divergent success, and the fifth a game that took mainstream appeal to a whole new level. While Resident Evil 6 has a loyal following all its own, it's hard to argue that it had one true identity. It feels like a twisted amalgamation of what the series once was, what it had become, and where it was going. A smorgasbord of what were, at that time, modern game styles fused together into something that lacked one true vision. In a way, the series had started to resemble one of the twisted, mangled monsters it's so famous for. A claw here, a tentacle and an eye there. With the series taking different steps in new directions, many wondered what a new mainline title would look like and who exactly it would appeal to. Then, in 2015 and 2016, ominous media surfaced that appeared to look like nothing fans had ever seen. An E3 2016 trailer debuted with a classic folk song and reimagined lyrics. The first person view and grotesque imagery had many curious, and some outright sold. The setting was different yet familiar, the approach characteristic but untraditional, the tone brooding yet intriguing. I'm just trying to show him not everybody wants to go back to how things were. I'll be real, when Resident Evil 7 dropped, I was at a very busy time in my life in which I wasn't gaming much. It was on my radar, but it took me a while to pick it up. Furthermore, the sixth entry had left a bad taste in my mouth. It wasn't until the remake of the second game released that I picked the seventh up. I binged both back to back in one snowy weekend, and while I thoroughly enjoyed the remake and still do, it was the seventh entry that stuck with me most. The story is engaging, the return to form a relief, and the new additions welcome. For all intents and purposes, I just knew it was a great game, and I'm sure there's millions of people out there who would agree. Recently, I had started exploring its concepts again, and it was then that I was struck with what I thought was a cool approach for a video. Spoilers for Resident Evil 7 and many other Resident Evil games ahead. How do you inject new life into what was, to speak frankly, a franchise very much in need of yet another evolution? How do you make another entry in a beloved 20-year-old franchise while appeasing diehard fans and grabbing new ones? Did Resident Evil 7 save the franchise? I think Resident Evil 7 succeeds in bringing to the forefront the true sense of helplessness and desperation players missed so much from earlier titles. Of all of the features the game utilizes to return to the series' roots, I find it's the sense of vulnerability forced onto the player that succeeds most. Resident Evil 7 throws stones. Lots of them. Horror stories often rely on vulnerability to create tension and scares. When a protagonist is in danger, overwhelmed, outnumbered, we as viewers feel that sensation as we follow them through the story. The more the odds are stacked against the main character, the harder we're going to root for them to get to safety. The more obstacles in their path, the less sure we are they're going to make it. The more terrifying the threats, the less equipped they are to survive. This element, vulnerability, is crucial to what makes survival horror so enthralling. I'm not going to get into the mechanics of the genre because I've done it so many times before, but it's safe to say that regardless of all of the shared features titles who claim the genre have, there is one that counts. Fear. But not fear of monsters. No, that's the horror part. I'm talking about fear for your own survival. Panic. Dread. Angst. 
The survival part is the element that makes players think carefully about their choices. The part that makes them wonder if perhaps they wasted too many bullets on that one enemy, or whether they could have taken a safer route, or if they should have used that last chem fluid on a healing item instead of bullets. It's the fear they've mismanaged resources, taken the wrong ones into battle, or missed crucial items while exploring. It's the fear that the enemies are just that much better than they are. It's the fear that too many stones have been thrown, and they're never going to get back down from that tree they've been chased up. In Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6, the characters feel well-trained and well-equipped. That's not a knock against those games. That's their identity, and that's okay. But enemies dropping items after death and characters trading currency with merchants is not generally what people associate with survival horror. An abundance of ammunition, weapons, and quick time events are also not staples of the genre. Resident Evil 7 strips all of these elements away and gets back to basics. It makes the main character and player vulnerable again. I've seen a lot of people discuss some of the horror inspirations Resident Evil 7 clearly draws from. For example, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Saw, and Alien franchises. But I also think it really leans into the ridiculous and amusing. The original Resident Evil games are unintentionally funny, but this one kind of leans into the bizarre, preposterous, and comical. It reminds me of a Sam Raimi film, specifically with its frantic camera work and body horror. Nevertheless, the game remains scary, a balance that is very difficult in horror. Does Resident Evil 7 fit into any other subgenres? I think it tries to incorporate many, even if some only briefly. It has some elements of slashers, body horror, splatter, found footage, torture horror, and comedy horror. For the most part, though, Resident Evil 7 replaces action and puts the survival back in survival horror. The villains specifically are the driving force behind the genre, and since they're at the forefront of the narrative, it gets quite mad. That descent into madness is precisely what makes this entry stand out from the others. It's a descent into a madhouse. Think about your favorite horror IP. Got it? Cool. I'll bet the main character is vulnerable for most, if not all, of the story. I'll bet the monster or killer outsmarts them until late in the third act. I'll bet the villain's got some defense or attack or weapon that terrifies the main characters. I'll bet that most, if not all, of the other characters die or are severely injured along the way. Why? Because characters who can throw down with a villain early in the story don't have very much to fear. Enter Ethan Winters, an admittedly strange choice for a protagonist in a series filled with many that are so coveted. But I think there's a reason for it, and a good one at that. Primarily, the choice to stay away from series regulars was to start fresh, but there's more to it. We all know that Ethan Winters is a point of contention for many players, but I think there's a simplicity to him that works on a design level. I don't think he was so well received when the title launched, and I still don't know that he's ever really been redeemed in the eyes of series fans. We'll leave the 8th mainline title, Village, out of the equation for now. Is he likable? Maybe not. I've seen many people comment on how he's a blank slate for the first person focused style, and that's a fair argument, but just because something is displayed in first person doesn't mean that it can't focus on character. What I do think is that for the first time in a long time, the title features a character who's somewhat of an everyman. Ethan is just some guy. As far as his characteristics and motivations, they're admittedly pretty bare bones. He's looking for his wife, whom he thought dead before the events of the story. It doesn't give us much to grab onto. He doesn't have any interesting characteristics, no flaws that need fixing, no great lessons to be learned. He's quippy, I guess. We're not provided with much. But what his character does provide is the clean slate the developers needed to make him and players feel helpless, but not incapable. There's no elite mercenaries or trained operators to be found here, at least not in the main game. It reminds me of the first title in the series. Remember when we first met the Stars team? We're led to believe they're elite. They're cops. They've got training. Still, they find they're unprepared for the terrors that lurk in the Spencer estate. Good though they may be, the bioweapons will challenge them at every turn, as well as the deceit. Back to Ethan. Ethan has that one goal, find his wife. It's pretty simple, and the search for a missing person is the start of many horror and thriller stories. Sometimes simple is good. The first title in the series initially starts in the same way. What was the goal? Find the missing STARS team members. A little bit of a callback. It's the treachery the STARS members uncover along the way that makes for an interesting story. Resident Evil 7 functions very much in the same way. 
When Ethan first finds Mia, she doesn't seem thrilled. Gee, thanks. Came all the way to Dolby, Louisiana just for that? But the truth is that Mia's goals were far more sinister. In my previous videos, I talked a lot about the controlling ideas and themes of the original games. Check those out if you like hearing me talk about the franchise. I reduced the original trilogy to one core idea, trust. Resident Evil 7 returns to this core concept, and this time with a similar twist. What starts as a traditional horror story, person goes looking for missing person, reveals a plot that challenges the beliefs of the protagonist, as well as the antagonist. It's a solid base, and makes me believe that the development team thought long and hard about what Resident Evil was, or is. We discover through the course of the story that Mia and her team were doing some very nefarious activities, a common trope viewers have come to expect from the series. There's a really good switch that happens here though. Mia, seemingly the victim, becomes the secondary villain. Not only is she the first enemy you face, but she and her partner, Alan, are revealed to be the reason behind all of the problems that have arrived in Dolby. When we're forced to play as her later, it becomes more meaningful because she has to work to clean up this mess she made. Not only have her and her team's actions brought this plague upon Dolby, but they've affected the poor Baker family. And probably the most unique and meaningful facet of Resident Evil 7's storytelling elements is the revelation of just what happened to the Baker family. For the better part of the game, players will have to contend with Jack, Lucas, Marguerite, and all of the terrifying transformations they go through. At first glance, they're just monstrous villains befitting the franchise, but the discovery of files and information adds more context to the story that emotionally elevates it beyond crazy family. And family is another theme present in the title, because Evelyn, the primary villain of this tale, has been plagued with a fungus that, while giving her incredible power, also seeks to acquire and preserve a family of its own. Her motivation is driven by a failure in trust, because players will learn that Mia betrayed her, or was at least willing to, as they uncover the backstory. This theme of family is just another facet of the story that separates it from the mundane. The villain is more than just a deceitful, conniving, power-hungry maniac the franchise has become so well known for. And dare I say by the end of the tale the narrative will have you feeling bad for all of the poor victims that suffer through it. Because that's what a lot of the characters wind up becoming in this story. Victims. Remember that vulnerability I was talking about? Many of the characters will suffer from it in this story. Not just the hero. Like a book or movie, a well-paced video game structure can make all the difference between a tedious experience that leads to burnout and a thrilling adventure. It's through the structure that we can dissect character action and motivation. Through structure, we can break down the plot into manageable bites that make the whole meal complete. To be completely forthcoming, I don't think Resident Evil's story is firing on all cylinders. It's a bit inconsistent, a little convoluted, and unfortunately features relatively undeveloped heroes. Its villains shine most brightly, and since this approach is about vulnerability and the terror that comes along with those villains, it's fitting they take center stage. I'm not breaking down the structure to prove that Resident Evil 7's narrative is its greatest strength, but rather to discuss how the structure is used effectively within the medium. A couple notes. One of them is that we're going to use the canon version of the story, which means that we'll choose to use the serum on Mia. More on that later. I also use the normal difficulty as the baseline for this video, but we can assume that a lot of the challenge and danger is amplified during the Madhouse difficulty. I'll try to point out some variations between the two if and when necessary. We're going to approach the structure section differently again. I'm not going to use a guide like Sid Fields or Robert McKees or Blake Snyder's. We're going to use a custom, albeit simple one. We're going to go up the tree. I've heard many people say to think of horror and thriller plots like a spring. You wind it up to create tension, then let it loose to release the tension, only to be wound up again. This is where the pace comes from. You put the audience on edge, give them a breath of fresh air, then put them through the ringer all over again. Resident Evil 7 winds that spring up early and keeps it tight for some time. Every time it releases it, it winds it back up in interesting ways. No plot section in the story emulates this more than the opening sequences. The setup starts with Ethan traveling to Dolby after receiving a phone call from Mia. We get the sense that there's some strange history between them, and discovering that she's still alive, Ethan goes looking for her. Interestingly, some of the first words out of Mia's mouth, though we don't realize it yet, are lies. Lies are another recurring motif in the series. Who's lying? Who's telling the truth? 
These are often questions that are answered as we progress. The first video ends and a new one begins, and the tone changes drastically. Mia gives Ethan a simple warning. Stay away. Do characters in horror stories ever heed advice like that? Not really, and we don't want them to. Resident Evil 7 burns slow at first, maybe even too slow, ask speedrunners. However, what comes soon after is earned. The setting is pure Resident Evil, dirty, desolate, and seemingly abandoned. It was right from the opening moments that players probably knew they were in for a treat. Ethan will set out on his adventure during daylight hours, a little bit of a reversal for a series that primarily takes place during the night. But it's not darkness that we have to fear just yet. It's the things that lurk on the property. You'll catch a glimpse of a strange old man wandering through the foliage, animal parts and tools combined to make revolting art projects, and finally, Mia's identification. We're on the right path. The home ahead must hold answers. After some investigation of this strange, unnerving home, players will soon discover a tape. The tape features the last moments of a ghost hunting television crew consisting of Peter, Andre, and Clancy of Sewer Gators as they investigate the Baker estate. As you can imagine, chaos ensues. The game uses this mechanic often. Teach players about environments and puzzles through flashbacks. Notice the early tip-off while the crew investigates the home. Hillbilly Joe and his family go missing. Not hillbillies, the Bakers. Jack and Marguerite Baker. And they were quiet, not backward. The narrative tells you not to make assumptions early on, but when someone comes for you wielding a shovel, you quickly forget about that context. The tape finishes when the characters meet their demise and Ethan discovers the clues needed to keep searching. In the inciting incident, he finds Mia, but not all is well. She's miffed that he came looking for her, and she seems all around confused about her current state. You'll look for an escape route together below the Baker estate. You'll attempt to return the way you came, but that plan is short-lived. Mia is possessed by some unknown force that will turn her loose against Ethan. It is here, in this moment, that Resident Evil 7 chases players up to the top limbs of the tree. You are not safe. When Mia attacks Ethan, we have no options presented to us. Mia will throw him through the holes like a rag doll. When he finally recuperates, he'll have to take another injury in the form of a knife through the hand. It's quite frightening and infinitely entertaining. You are helpless to defend yourself. We spend so much time in these games trying to avoid injury. No damage runs are a staple of streaming within the community. But in Resident Evil 7, Ethan has no choice but to take it. It's arguably the most violent introduction to a video game I've ever seen. I'm here for it. Next, Mia fights off this intruder within her, and she does so by slamming her head against the wall repeatedly. There is nothing you can do to help her. After some more investigation, Mia will spring to life once more. And this time you'll be handed your first defense item, a hatchet. It's a far cry from the introductory pistols the series is famous for. This is another great moment of putting the player off kilter. Sure, you've been given a weapon to defend yourself, and that should make you feel a little more confident. But think about what the narrative is forcing you to do. Defend yourself from your wife. That's literally the only option that is presented to you. It's really twisted. We meet our first supporting character, Zoe, and she starts to deliver some vague tips to Ethan. After subduing Mia, she'll return yet again. This moment presents a major question that is really fun and provides the first clue that nothing is what it seems. She's healed herself, at least enough so that she can continue her pursuit. You might have wondered in that moment when this spring is going to be released, but the tension is only going to increase. Ethan gets pinned to the wall through his hand with a screwdriver, grotesque and terrifying. As he struggles to remove it, Mia retrieves a chainsaw, certainly a nod to an iconic 70s slasher, and one of many in the game. It also seems like the series tried this idea in the fourth entry and struggled to let go of it. Oddly enough, it's this entry setting and aesthetic in which the tool fits the best. There's a great feeling of defeat in this moment. Ethan struggles to remove the screwdriver, twisting and turning while Mia approaches with the screaming chainsaw, and just as he finally removes it, she cuts right through his hand. Holy shit. I really couldn't believe this entry went there. What a start. To have the audacity to gravely injure a character so early on was exactly the breath of fresh air this series needed. It really goes a long way to remind you that you will suffer. Not only have you just lost a limb, but it was your crazed wife who facilitated it. In screenwriting, there's a general rule that you should hook your reader within the first 10 pages. 
Many screenplays have probably found their way into a trash can because they could not hold the reader's interest. If we treat these opening moments in Resident Evil 7 like the first 10 pages of a screenplay, it does not suffer from this problem. As you return from the chaos, severed limbs squirting blood, it's only natural to feel panic. It isn't until after this moment that you'll finally get a handgun. And once you finally do, the game doesn't make you feel as if it's really going to protect you. Those bullets just barely stop Mia as she cuts through walls. If you have poor aim, and I know sometimes I do, you'll make it through with a few bullets to spare. On the Madhouse difficulty, this battle is one of the toughest in the game. You've stopped the threat and shot your wife. What a double whammy. Psychologically, I think it really does a great job of differentiating this title from other games in the series. You've started off with a weakness. It also sets up the real debate question. What the hell happened to Mia? And is Ethan equipped to handle this situation? The good news is, you've made it out alive, right? Nope. Soon after, you'll be confronted by Jack Baker, and he'll put you right back in your place. Now, something interesting happens in the narrative here that kind of pushes back against my argument a little bit. I'll admit it. Ethan's limb is reattached by a mysterious character and appears to be in fine working order. Well, that doesn't make any sense. How the hell would such a grave injury be so easily patched? That does not make me feel at risk anymore. In fact, for some players, Resident Evil 7 might have jumped the shark right in its first act. But ultimately, Ethan's infection winds up being a plot construction that, while providing a great excuse for adept healing capabilities, doesn't make him any more safe while exploring the Baker estate. He might be able to heal efficiently, but that doesn't mean he can't be killed. You'll meet the Baker family proper, Jack, his wife Marguerite, and their son Lucas. There's also a mysterious old woman sitting beside you in a chair. Let's be real, the game wears the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise on its sleeve for a bit, but you know what? Imitation is a form of flattery. I've never played the game in VR, but I imagine this scene is yet another that goes a long way toward making the player feel like all these terrible events are happening to them. The Baker family tortures Ethan and each other. I think this sequence just reinforces my point. Sure, you're seemingly immune from injury, and so are they. But if they'll hurt each other for kicks, what will they do to you? I struggled with figuring out what the first major plot point of the game is. I actually think there's several, but I think it comes right about here. And it's pretty simple. Get out of this house. If a plot point generally spins the story in a dramatically different direction, this would be it. Ethan came here looking for his wife. Now his priority is to get the hell out. Resident Evil 7 has chased you up a tree. The narrative strips you of weapons. One of many times it will do this. This recurring technique goes a long way to adding to that sense of defenselessness the story often relies on. There is a constant reminder of your inadequacy in the form of Ethan's stapled hand. Every time his hand appears in frame, the unsettling reminder of the injury is presented. The infection has made this medical miracle possible, but that's not clear until later. I think this actually winds up being an interesting justification for some of the damage that's done to the protagonist throughout the story. Generally, we're required to utilize the suspension of disbelief to imagine that locally grown herbs and cans of first aid spray will combat viral infections, but in this title, the logic is a little more concrete. This idea carries over to the next entry, Village, as well. Jack will pursue you throughout the house while you sneak from room to room. You'll have to use patience to acquire tools, because carelessness will not work here. This wonderful little moment happened to me the last time I played the game, and it's never happened to me before. Jack caught me slipping and cut my leg off. It was just a reminder that I didn't stand a chance, and I had to crawl to retrieve a healing item so I could reattach it while he laughed at me. A nice surprise I'd never experienced. A reprieve comes in the form of Deputy David Anderson. He's not so trusting at first, but he'll finally provide you with a knife that will help you proceed. I like this little nod because, again, in the original Resident Evil, the stars were just cops investigating missing people, echoing the original setup. Unfortunately, Anderson's time within the narrative is short-lived because Jack will slice his head in half with a shovel. Now Ethan will be trapped in this arena and will see just how mad the fungus really makes its victims. You'll fight Jack for the steering wheel of a vehicle in the garage, then he'll go fully crazed and try to take you down with him. 
What's great here is that his actions drive the insanity even further. Just when you think you can grab a firearm, Jack comes to and steals it from you. But he doesn't kill you. Instead, he blows half of his head off. Jack has no fear, not in this state, and it only makes him more terrifying. I really like the chaotic approach here. No longer are the enemies shambling zombies or villagers under the spell of a virus. Rather, they're infected individuals that still possess the autonomy to make insane decisions. They're coherent, but nutty, another aspect that makes the threats feel fresh. Finally, Ethan's got a gun. Unfortunately, as you continue to try to accumulate the items needed to progress, Jack continues to stalk you through the home, reminiscent of both Mr. X and the nemesis from earlier titles. It seems like the series is destined to always work some pursuer enemy into its design. Like some of its earliest predecessors, Resident Evil 7 often rewards running, not fighting. He's stronger and faster than you, and since he can't be killed at this stage, you'll be forced into cowardice just to deal with him. Your gun will stop him briefly, but it won't take care of him completely. Again, that vulnerability is up front and center. You can fight, but you can't win. Often, vulnerability is associated with games that don't provide any weapons at all, but you can provide the player with weapons and still make them feel inadequate when facing threats. Developers need only remind the player that just because they can choose to defend themselves doesn't mean they're in charge. There's probably an opportunity here to talk about alien isolation and its design, but I'm going to save that for another day. Players paying attention will also notice Marguerite lurking. The fact that she talks to herself only makes her more disturbing. There's screws loose, and you just know you'll have to contend with her sooner or later. You'll even get a taste of her mechanics, and how to best her, by viewing Mia's tape if you watch it. Notice how the game strips you of any weapons again in this section. You'll have no choice against Marguerite but to hide. This amplifies the level of fear players experience, because you just know if she catches you, you're done for. To find the last piece for the three-headed dog door, you'll have to venture into the depths below. The game finally introduces you to enemies you can kill, but that doesn't mean they'll be easy to defeat. You'll have your first encounter with the molded, and soon realize that these aren't shuffling zombies either. They twitch and jerk and make hitting them with bullets difficult. Headshots are key, or you'll waste your ammo. More importantly, just like you, they can block, making those desired headshots even more of a challenge. Fail to kill one before you retreat from its zone of interest, and they'll return to the mold only to resurface when you do. Along with the Baker family, the molded are a fresh take on the traditional enemies of the series. There's no zombies, no viruses. Resident Evil 7 seeks to revamp series tropes. On the Madhouse difficulty setting, Jack is relentless, and item placement is changed as well. The molded are less forgiving, and you'll find them in different locations in different varieties. It truly makes for some fun surprises, if you like being punished. But not all threats can actually harm you, at least not in the traditional way. Players who fear the strange and unusual will surely be distressed to happen upon the old lady in the wheelchair. She may not be able to injure you, but she'll certainly unsettle. Her eyes follow you as you move around her, and you just know there's something seriously wrong going on. No information is provided regarding her name or purpose just yet. Procuring the shotgun will help as you continue your journey, but soon after you'll also meet variations of the molded which reduce its effectiveness, even in tight quarters. It's also another little easter egg for original fans, because you won't be able to take it without offering a replacement. When you finally got that last dog head, you'll face off with Jack yet again. You didn't think it was going to be that easy, did you? Come on. The most common Resident Evil plot mechanic is to have a player retrieve a needed item let them attempt to leave with it, then force them to face off against a creature. Love it. Finally, you'll get a chainsaw of your own, but the playing field is small, and facing off against Jack in these tight quarters, especially in first person, is no easy feat. You'll need to use the environment to your advantage if you want to survive. If you're successful, you're free to escape, so let's release the tension on that spring for a moment. The narrative introduces you to your sort of home base, the trailer, here, you're free to take a breath, organize your items, save your game, and maybe even invest in some new goodies. Zoe raises the stakes by telling you what you probably already knew. We're all infected, and we can't leave unless we purge ourselves of the infection. She'll provide you with a new task. Find the items that will help us concoct a serum. 
you'll venture off into a new section of the property, reminiscent of the STARS members' exploration of the dormitories. Noticing a trend here? You'll meet Marguerite proper, and all of her friends, too. The insects that swarm with her provide more of a nuisance than an interesting enemy, but for players with fears of critters, this section has plenty to offer. One of the things I love about Marguerite's location is that you feel trapped by the swamp. It's a reminder that you can't just up and walk away from this property. There's no escape through these murky waters. A reunion with Mia is short-lived, because the crazed Lucas will capture her before she has a chance to say much. Discovering the new plans for a unique weapon will help protect you from insects, but even the design feels inadequate. It's makeshift and cobbled together and doesn't feel like a weapon that packs the punch you really need other than to make the enemies manageable. You'll face off with Marguerite when you finally got the key for the crow door. Jeez, speaking of doors, even the doors in this game are disgusting. Someone just straight up pinned a crow to this door. Dead animals are also a recurring motif in the game. Yuck. Just when you thought you'd be able to grab Marguerite's key item, a lantern, it will return back to the mold with her, snatched away at the last second. Another call from Zoe will point you in the right direction, and you'll discover the instructions for the serum in this odd box. If you want that lantern, you'll have to find it in the greenhouse. It's here where Marguerite will reveal her true form, a gangly, vicious version of herself. This is hands down one of my favorite battles from the series. It's got a cool arena that has multiple levels and Marguerite can navigate in and out of it, but Ethan can't. Your best strategy here is to listen for her, and since the sound design in this entry is A+, it makes it all the more fun. Shooting her in her, uh, weak area will finally take her down, but you'll have to contend with swarms of insects as she crawls from room to room. The lighting works really well here too, because the dark pockets play tricks on your eyes. Ethan will return to the upper floors of Marguerite's domain, and it is here where the game really introduces its true villain. You'll discover children's drawings, toys, and even be taunted by a young girl's voice. Some backstory is revealed if you pay attention. You'll catch one quick glimpse of Evelyn, and more molded try to stop you. When you return to the trailer, you'll find you've been beaten to the punch. Lucas's games begin in earnest, and the first task is to return to the house and grab some keys he's hidden inside of it. More molded appear, making familiar places scary all over again. One of my favorite story elements is expanded on here as the spring is unwound, and it involves the bakers. Even though you've just killed two, there's these little reminders all over the house that they were just people. Jack's picture when he left for the Marines, Lucas's journal entries, Marguerite's doctor's notes. It really goes a long way to humanizing these people, and I just love it. You'll retrieve another tape regarding a birthday celebration, and if you don't watch it before doing the puzzle that comes later, you'll probably die before you learn from your mistakes. What's so warped about this tape is that there is no success. The victim will have to suffer through the consequences of what is seemingly victory, only to die a fiery, excruciating death. Those screams are horrible every time. Ethan will pursue Lucas, but Lucas is deranged and he won't pursue you in the ways Jack and Marguerite do. Instead, he'll force you to pursue him while you contend with his sick traps and obstacles. The game tosses another little stone here and it comes in the form of trick item boxes. Some boxes will explode when destroyed, so you will have to relearn your approach to resource collection. Rushing could be a mistake. He'll even force you to join in a one-on-one -on -one match with a larger molded. This molded might not have the speed or melee skills his friends do, but he can spit at you from a distance, making quickly dispatching him a priority. After stripping you of your weapons again, you'll have to solve another of Lucas's puzzles. Hopefully, you've learned the lessons the game tries to teach you with videotapes and succeeded on your first try. I didn't. <laughs> With the last items needed for the serum in hand, it's off to save Mia and Zoe. Zoe makes the serum, but nothing is ever easy in Resident Evil games. Jack returns once more, this time transformed further. You'll have to aim for his weak spots. Eyes. Another callback to many a Resident Evil title. What's cool here is that this is another battle in which you can navigate between two floors to gain an advantage. I think this was well suited to the first person playstyle, and makes the battle arenas really fun to navigate. 
This is the first battle that really feels like you're the one throwing stones, because you've probably loaded up on ammunition and weapons that will help you defeat Jack once and for all. Remember back when I said Resident Evil doesn't really offer much choice in terms of story? The same is not true here, to some degree. During the second act, the narrative will force players to choose which character they'll provide the serum to, Mia or Zoe. Instinctually, I'll bet most players will choose Mia. After all, she is the protagonist's wife, but I'm sure some chose Zoe. This is a real gut punch that I'm sure players struggled with for a moment. The only reason you've got a serum is because Zoe guided you. On the other hand, how could you possibly not save your wife? This may not be a challenging gameplay mechanic, but it is a story-focused challenge. I can't think of another time a Resident Evil game forced players to consider a decision like this. But the closest I can think of is when Jill debates giving Barry his gun back. This moment feels more suited to a game like The Last of Us, but it's welcome nonetheless. Ultimately, this choice may be meaningless, but it's still a really interesting idea. No matter who players choose, they'll still be stuck with the guilt of their choice. Ethan will soon recognize what Mia's actions have led to, and I'd argue it forces the player to rethink that choice all over again. When you leave Zoe behind, you'll learn about Mia's darker side, and it really made me reconsider what the hell I'd just done. Luckily, some DLC provides closure to Zoe's story for those seeking it, specifically in the form of Uncle Joe and his fists. Escape is in sight. Ethan and Mia will finally be able to traverse the swamp waters and be free of this nightmare. But just when Mia decides to be forthcoming, the mold returns, this time beside the remains of a destroyed tanker. There's another interesting choice by the developers here, and that comes in the form of switching to an alternate character. It's very Code Veronica-esque. Though the tanker is my least favorite section of the game, I'd argue it's one of the most intriguing. The backstory could have been handled with lazy exposition. Mia could have told Ethan what happened, and we could have just listened. Instead, you're forced to go explore the events of the past with Mia. It's a great way of recontextualizing what happened, and I don't know that any Resident Evil title has ever done anything like that other than the second entry. I'm sure the fans will prove me wrong. As is customary, Mia will be stripped of her weapons yet again, a simple nuance used to great effect. This time it's even more fun because the ship will be crawling with molded, and typically we've had ways of defending ourselves. You'll meet Evelyn and she'll try to remind Mia where she failed along the way. Mia's plot is explored through amnesia, which I don't generally care for as a plot mechanic, but at least we get to experience it firsthand and play it through. Evelyn's origins are explained through files, so I'm not going to dig too deep on this other than to point out that they're the vehicle through which we finally get the context surrounding the Annabelle. Classic Resident Evil. Evelyn forces Mia to watch her misdeeds through VHS tape, and using the same methodology as explored previously, we experience the catastrophe that befell the Annabelle when it arrived in Dolby. This plot section is enthralling. We learn of Mia's status as a member of the criminal organization only known as The Connections, a great reveal that suggests Ethan never really knew who she was. Sound familiar to any other Resident Evil games? As Evelyn reconciles the events surrounding her caretakers, she goes completely berserk and not only attacks the ship's crew, but also infests it with mold. I'd argue that telling the story through Mia's point of view entirely might actually have been more interesting. Mia's motivations are more clear than Ethan's, and allowing her to uncover the truth while she fights off the molded could have been a great springboard for a tighter plot. I'll talk about that later. Regardless, I do like the heightened atmospheric tension of this section. The abandoned industrial setting, flashing lights, steam, sirens, it all reminds me of the Alien franchise, an IP the series has certainly taken inspiration from before. What I find so intriguing about this part of the plot is that it's a great twist to turn the victim into the villain. All along, Ethan believed that he needed to rescue Mia, but we as the audience soon learn that it will be Ethan who needs rescuing, and Mia who has to do it. After Evelyn's had her way with the ship, all while Mia must battle through an infected crew, the events leading up to the main plot are tied up neatly. Alan, Mia's partner in crime, is killed by Evelyn, and we see her ability to infect and destroy people firsthand in gruesome detail. And now you're back to the present and Mia knows full well the horrors she's brought onto this innocent community. As she continues to search her way around the derelict ship, she'll finally pinpoint Ethan's location, 
but getting there won't be easy, and while you do so, you'll have to fend off all the molded that have made the vessel a home. Though I stated it as my least favorite section, I do admit I've grown to like it more and more every time I play it, and I think it's because of a combination of things. First, Mia is revealed to be no pushover. She's seemingly well-trained with weapons, resources, and explosives, and a character we thought needed a rescue is far better equipped than her supposed savior to handle the enemies pursuing her. I said that Resident Evil 7 works because of vulnerability, but since we're in the late game, Mia's expertise is welcome. Second, you'll finally get some great gear, including explosives and a map that requires backtracking and navigation. Getting the elevator working again is the primary goal, and it'll take all the skill you've learned thus far to do it. Eventually, with some persistence, you'll discover Ethan. Unfortunately, Evelyn is not happy with the outcome. Sensing a threat to her idea of this newly created family, she'll attempt to kill Mia too. Another distinctive story beat happens here, and it is when Ethan is reminded of the humanity of the Bakers. She forces a way into your mind, your soul. The late third act reveal with Jack is perhaps one of the series' highlights. Through this interaction with Jack, we get a story moment that exonerates the villains of their sins, and though they spent the better part of the plot trying to murder Ethan, the justifications are warranted. It brings the plot back down to earth a little bit, makes us feel for the victims of this scenario in ways that other entries have not. I don't know that any villain in the series has ever been humanized in this way, and truthfully, the methodology works across most if not all of the characters, including Jack, Marguerite, Mia, and Evelyn. If great villains have pure motivations, ones that we can often empathize with, Evelyn's and the Bakers are some of the better of the series. Ethan, free my family, please. Notice the disregard Mia and company had for Evelyn. They were going to dispose of her should things have gotten out of hand. No different than something Umbrella might have done with one of their own projects. A child. Disposable. It's pretty macabre. Let's talk about that alternative serum choice for a moment. If you choose to save Zoe, being forced to kill Mia is actually a really wild twist. I talk about the difference between character wants and needs a lot. This scenario offers an interesting dynamic. Ethan wants to save Mia but he needs to kill her. Unfortunately, though true horror, it's not canon. Mia redeems herself to a degree by making the ultimate sacrifice. It's a selfless act, and fitting considering most of this fiasco is due to her team's lack of hubris. The last major plot point arrives, and Mia states it very clearly. Kill Evelyn. Mia's complexion darkens, and we see the effects of Evelyn's control over her resume. The last sharp stone has been thrown. Maybe we can save her. If we can stop Evelyn, Ethan is propelled into the final act. Now go kill that little bitch. No, no. Mia! No! Throughout this essay, I've tried to provide examples of ways that Resident Evil 7 makes players feel vulnerable, but as Ethan is thrust toward a conclusion, that sensation is subdued greatly. And rightfully so. It is in the final moments of the narrative that Resident Evil 7 does not force you to fight with one arm tied behind your back, but rather come out swinging. Sorry, wrong section. Before you head into what will be the final stretch, a helicopter in the distance signals some hope. Documents reveal perhaps they've been surveying the property for some time. The momentum is powerful here, and the pace more high octane. Perhaps the game has started to lean into some of the action horror tropes the series had grown into, but truthfully, most third acts do. Don't worry about getting hit with stones. Now you're throwing them. Though I think the mine is introduced abruptly, it still makes for an exciting romp. I don't know that it serves the plot of this game in any meaningful way like the other locations do. It feels tacked on and isn't really given the backstory or justification needed to make it expand the story in a way one might hope. In Resident Evil 4 and 5, underground caverns and mines are explained thoroughly. The same can't be said in this case. The molded are out in full force, and Ethan will be forced to dump all that ammo that's been accumulating to make it through. A gauntlet of molded variations will stand in your way. It's a true descent into hell. The behavior of the mutamycete, the fungus the characters have been exposed to, is explained, and so too many of the characteristics associated with the Baker family and Evelyn. 
Ethan will make a batch of necrotoxin. The exit is in sight. As your final challenge, you'll go up against not one, but two of the larger molded together. Truthfully, it's a little underwhelming, only because the final boss is equally so. Unlike the tradition of most Resident Evil titles, in which your final encounter will test your metal fully, this game does not offer that same level of challenge. Maybe it's because you've learned how to deal with the molded so well, or maybe it's because you've become worthy of victory. Either way, it doesn't provide the thrill of earned success. Ethan will find another route back into the Baker estate, and what do you know, you've been here before. Now the hallucinations that befell other characters during the course of the story will plague Ethan, a ticking clock that comes a little late. I think it would have been cool if this was introduced earlier, if the fungus was given an incubation time period that made the race against time a little more present earlier in the story, because Ethan starts seeing hallucinations, and furthermore, the entire intro is recontextualized with new information about Evelyn. We relive the entirety of the opening sequence from the outside in, and learn that, surprise, the old lady in the wheelchair was Evelyn the whole time. The mutamycete has resulted in her aging rapidly. This poor, helpless old woman is behind this whole fiasco. It's another twist that retroactively challenges our beliefs about villainy. Ethan injects her with the necrotoxin, but unlike Jack, it doesn't result in her quick demise. No, instead, Evelyn will stand her ground and put up one final fight, though it's not really much of a fight at all. Once you've put a couple bullets into her, she'll grab hold of Ethan and take him back out onto the home's exterior property. She throws Ethan around like a toy, pounding and thrashing and just completely having her way with him. Luckily, a helping hand delivers the last weapon Ethan will need to end this fight once and for all and a callback to a series antagonist. Though she's taken the form of this raging, massive, tentacled creature, players are ostensibly forced to kill an old woman. It's really disturbing. This was an innocent kid gone astray, lied to, manipulated, and abandoned. She was misguided, and suffered the consequences for it. If you stop and think about what you're forced to do here, what you learn to get here, it makes it all the more impactful. Fire the gun in time, and Evelyn will go down, calcified and solidified into a dried out husk that will terrorize no more. And just when you probably forgot you were playing a Resident Evil game, who else comes fast roping in but Chris Redfield, albeit with divisive character model. I still don't understand why this character model is so debated. I don't think there's anything groundbreaking about it, but I also don't know that it's enough to grab my pitchfork and torch over. It's hard to unanimously please Resident Evil fans, but I think Seven comes close. The characters are cured, for now, and reunited. A familiar logo goes through a rebranding to represent the accountability an old corporation has taken to clean up their act. The characters ride off into the sunset on a helicopter, because what kind of Resident Evil game would it be if they didn't? I try to be fair, so let's run over some things about the plot I don't care for. The three-year gap in between Mia's arrival and Ethan's receipt of the message isn't well-defined. I don't know that we're given a very plausible explanation of what happened during that time. As far as plot holes go, maybe it's a crater, maybe it's a nitpick. Either way, it's not important enough to the central ideas the story explores to make me lose interest. Just a lack of oversight, I think. It's probably the main character who's the weakest link here. Generally, a story's main character should be the thing that audiences connect with. But I'm not sure that has ever been the case with any Resident Evil title. Ethan has some agency, and that's cool, but there's no definitive characteristics that make him memorable within the context of other series regulars. I've never claimed that beloved franchise characters are that well-defined either, and I think that's a problem the series has always suffered from. It makes up for that with its intriguing plots and lore, and they carry a lot of the weight that the characters generally can't. Another big caveat I have is enemy variety, but I think it's made up for by making several main characters enemies in and of themselves. Resident Evil 7 focuses its energy onto the Baker family and Mia, and instead of throwing hordes of different experiments your way, it tries to lean into several fun ones. As I said before, Evelyn's final confrontation is kind of weak too. It's not really challenging, and it's not super creative. It feels more cinematic in its closure, rather than a final bout that tests your ability to strategize. I also think this story could have been trimmed and simplified. Mia probably would have worked better as the main character. Think about it. Here's a quick pitch. Mia wakes up in the first act with the same amnesia the story presents. She finds herself in the Baker home and is terrorized by the occupants. As she tries to escape, 
she discovers she's infected by the mold. It's a race against time. Sensing a threat to her own existence, Evelyn sends the Baker family to destroy her. During the second act, Mia uncovers clues to piece together her memories and then discovers she is responsible for the predicament she's in. Feeling guilt, she realizes she must free the Baker family and stop Evelyn. You could literally keep the entirety of the game and just view it through a different lens that makes for a tighter story. Only this time, you are responsible for the viral outbreak. It would have been a cool twist on the formula. Ultimately, the game's strengths lie in its balance between the old and the new. Resident Evil may have been in critical condition, but it was revived. It lost some limbs and reattached new ones, stronger, better ones. Limbs infused with the viral cells of something old to make something new. One recurring motif throughout the game is regeneration, and I think this title exemplifies that within the franchise. What about the elements that fit with the game's design that aren't story related? First person was a nice change. Unlike the old days of door loading animations, every opportunity to open a door is a panic attack waiting to happen. You never know what's behind them, and your light only shines so far. The inability to see behind you as you travel tight corridors only makes the danger that much more frightening. Whereas you could see danger within a given space in the old days, now it can creep up behind you with little warning. Consider the fact that the game also benefited from a VR version to accommodate the first person playstyle. Again, I won't speak on it because I haven't tried it, but it's safe to say that even this edition signaled a fresh start. The sound design and mixing is a series high as well. Every step, every squirm, every splash and strike and groan. The Baker Estate itself seems to be alive, creaking and whining and buzzing with a nostalgia fans yearn for, but had been missing. The setting of Resident Evil 7 is a character within itself, a dark, desolate location isolated from the outside world, the perfect place for a spooky tale. Isolation is not just present in the location. Resident Evil 7 is the first game in the series in a long time in which players truly feel alone. There's no partners to be found outside of breaks for dialogue. Backtracking returns, and with it the surprises players expect from discovering new secrets and re-examining sites visited prior. The geography has character, and instead of sprawling, open settings, characters rarely if ever return to, several smaller settings are squeezed for every drop. Lighting also plays a huge role this time around. Ethan's flashlight is only capable of illuminating a small area, limiting vision to a little gradient of safety that falls off quickly in large areas. And complementing that lighting is a color palette unlike any the franchise has seen before. Resident Evil 7 is committed to its color scheme, a dingy mix of earthy tones that separates its aesthetic from the other games in the series. Many of the games are populated with vibrant color. This entry mutes its tones to go for something a little more autumnal. It is rare in this entry that any one color is heavily saturated, and most of the time that feature is limited to key items and resources. The derelict nature of the Baker Estate is made only more foul by this choice, and sticking with the muted, location-specific color schemes carried over to Village in the same way. The puzzles lean into the vulnerability mechanic as well. Just the sheer amount of injuries characters suffer at the hands of Lucas's twisted games are enough to make players writhe in discomfort. I don't think I can recall any other Resident Evil entry that forces players to suffer significant injury to complete a puzzle, even if the damage is superficial. Take Lucas's happy birthday sequence. If you viewed the VHS tape preemptively to learn what mistakes were made before Ethan makes them again, several forms of gruesome attacks take place. The first comes in the form of an exploding balloon, which not only impales the character's hand with a nail, but also stabs them in the gut with a quill. If that wasn't enough, that same quill is used to carve a puzzle password into the player's arm. Brutal. The assault features a finale in which a bomb explodes right in your face. If you haven't learned how to subvert the sequence properly, you'll suffer the consequences when you attempt the puzzle with Ethan. The block mechanic plays into the same idea of desperation. There's no shields, no parries, no body armor with which to reduce damage. All Ethan can do is throw his hands up and hope for the best. It won't keep you safe, which means injuries are still possible, but it will reduce the amount of damage you take. And though you'll still get an EKG-like health readout in the form of a wrist device called a codex, 
a reminder of your own mortality is presented as blood on screen when you've taken damage. As with any title within the survival horror space, ammunition amount seemingly fluctuates based on skill. In the tradition of classic Resident Evil games, players will probably find themselves scraping by on their first playthroughs, while subsequent runs will leave them with an abundance. What I'm concerned with is that first experience in which everything consists of trial and error, and every surprise is meaningful and dangerous. Mastering the skills needed to best the challenge is ingrained within the genre and its replayability, but when I played Resident Evil 7 for the first time, I felt like I wished I always just had a few more bullets. Even weapons take an interesting form. When you first find the shotgun, you might be thrilled to feel like you've retrieved a weapon with some power. Soon after, you'll discover the plans for another weapon that will aid you, but this one is makeshift and fits within the style of the game. I mean, just look at this flamethrower. It's been improvised by parts one could find in their local hardware store. Hardly a weapon to be feared, unless you're an insect. It has no real stopping power and requires quite a bit of fuel to reduce an enemy's health worth a damn. The grenade launcher packs that significant punch you'll be looking for, but at a cost. You can only load one round at a time, so firing at will is foolish. You'll need to think about how and when you're going to use it. As always, the Magnum, a serious staple, returns, but this time you'll have to earn it. Fail to find the antique coins required to unlock it and you'll never even have a chance of using it. The upgrade, purchase, and sale systems of Resident Evil 4 and 5 are fun and exciting, but it'd be remiss of me if I said I felt like they belonged in this franchise. You'll initially have few and limited opportunities to build your character in any way that makes him get the upper hand. Steroid injections will increase maximum health, but there's not many to be found. Rather than upgrade guns, you'll have two opportunities to repair broken ones. There's some unique ammunition options, but you'll have to part with resources that could be used elsewhere to create them. Item management has evolved, and I'd debate in an interesting way. No longer will you have a slim inventory. It's been replaced with a larger version, but there's a catch. Rather than space being an issue, what you decide to utilize that space and resources for is paramount. Chem fluid becomes a sort of catch-all item that works in conjunction with others, and you'll have to decide what your most efficient uses for it are based on your playstyle. Psychostimulants also add for an interesting mechanic. Want to use them for ammo? See what you get. Want to use them to find more items? You might find that now space is an issue during discovery. The Madhouse difficulty brings back a staple mechanic from the original trilogy in the form of audio cassette tapes another item players will have to ration. Fail to allocate these resources when needed, and saving the game will become just another hurdle. Recording your progress too often and running out of tapes will force you to play through large sections of difficult challenges and cutscenes if you fail. All of the systems contribute to this same core idea. Resident Evil 7 does not want you to feel like a superhero. It is not a power fantasy. As with any good story, you will overcome the odds, but you will have to work for it, you'll have to suffer for it, you'll have to crawl through sludge, beg for mercy, and put yourself right in the large, tentacled face of danger. You'll have to get up close and personal with the monsters that terrorize these poor victims to survive. Resident Evil 7 fundamentally works, and it's rare that sequels, reboots, and reimaginings hit the bullseye. Because let's face it, that's what Resident Evil 7 feels like. It feels like the developer said, we can't go down the same path we've been going down. It was fun, but we may have lost our way a bit. We know the destination we need to get to, but we need to change the route and the vehicle. Resident Evil 7 chases players up the tree, pummels them with stones, then convinces them they are ready and worthy of getting back down. Somehow, it manages to feel like a classic in the vein of the original trilogy, while being something entirely its own. It made me scared again in a way some of the later games haven't. Despite some missteps along the way, Resident Evil 7 is a reminder that this franchise is poised to survive, to get back down from the tree no matter how many stones have been thrown. Yo, it took me quite a while to get to another essay. Sorry, but I've been really busy. I'm working on more manuscripts, more screenplays, and streaming on Twitch. Yeah, get at me at Shark Cookies. I've really been focusing on indie horror lately because a lot of the games I've been playing have heart. I'll try to get some more videos out soon. 
I appreciate the viewers who keep coming back. Thanks so much for watching. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe to the channel. Give it a thumbs up or comment. Share it with your friends or survival horror fans. Be sure to check out my other videos about the Resident Evil franchise. I'll be back with more soon. Be nice to each other in the comments. Thanks for watching.